Hello everyone and welcome. In this video, as a general theme, we're talking about what today's best electric vehicles are. Uh, and so this is a bit inspired by Car and Driver's EV of the Year. And if you can see from this magazine cover, uh, they gave it to the Ford Mustang Mach-E, which is an excellent electric car and it's pretty solid. Um, however, in this video, I don't have anything against their decision there. Um, I don't think you should either. Like, I'm not here to be like, well, eh, Tesla should win. Who cares? Uh, pick what car is right for you the end but this car this tesla model 3 performance that we are sitting in right now which is three years old is still still a good bit ahead of the competition three years later that's coming out today uh, and i find that you know pretty impressive on tesla's part uh, how advanced this car is um, considering its age relative to the new things that are coming out today so in this video, we're gonna be talking about these 11 electric cars that Car and Driver compared. Uh, I'm gonna show you lots of bar charts because I know everyone loves bar charts, uh, but we're gonna tell a pretty convincing story with these bar charts about how dominant Tesla is. So it is my opinion that as it relates to electric cars, convenience is king. Now, if you have multiple cars and a place to charge an electric car, who cares? Get whatever electric car satisfies your needs, the end. Uh, don't worry about, you know, how convenient the one vehicle is uh, if you have multiple cars to do multiple things. But if you're just using one car, in my opinion, that car should be as close to, if not equally, if not better than, from a convenience standpoint, gasoline cars. And so that is the challenge faced by electric cars. And the biggest place you notice this discrepancy in the convenience factor is on a road trip. So car and driver did a test where they took, you know, 11 cars and they ran a thousand miles uh, and they tried out these different electric cars to see See how they did on a road trip which is the most difficult scenario because it basically tests all of the convenient factors of an electric car now one of the first things electric car makers love to tell you and they'll give you this very high very exciting number is how much power you can charge their cars with so how fast you can charge these cars and they give you this peak power rate it's kind of like uh you know manufacturers give a peak horsepower rate right but you don't know what the torque curve actually looks like you have to go in and look at it and the same is true for these power curves um, and how fast these things charge because on the low end of the battery sure they'll charge very fast and so I'll show you a comparison of what everyone's claiming their you know peak charging speed is for all these different electric cars but then if you add into that chart what the average time is which car and driver tested from 10% to 90% charge so you know a realistic 10 to 90% to charge of that battery then you get an average charging speed which may or may not be significantly lower than that peak charging rate and in most cases it's quite a bit lower um, so Tesla did really well here Audi did really well here Porsche did really well here uh, the Mustang did not do well here and the reason why the Mach-E didn't do well is because after 80% its charging speed drops off dramatically so it's actually pretty good up to 80% um, it went from 10% battery to 70% battery in about 35 minutes uh, but it took 90 minutes to go from 10% to 90% it was the longest out of everything tested to get to that 90% and it's because they have a really slow charging rate from 80% to 90% maybe they'll update that in the future um, but for now the Mustang charges really slow above 80% now, thinking about how quickly something charges by looking at percentages may or may not make sense to you. And all of these different manufacturers, they come up with these different ways to tell you that their car charges really quickly uh, by saying it goes from 10 to 60% or something like that. And it's like, well, how far does that actually get me? So Car and Driver actually does a really clever test. So they look at how much time do you need to spend at a charger in order to drive 100 miles on the highway at 75 miles per hour. And so that number for the Tesla Model S is just 11 minutes uh, which is very impressive that was the quickest time uh, and then the slowest time was the Nissan Leaf at 45 minutes so not very convenient there now, another deceptive part of the story with electric cars is how far can you actually drive on the highway? And so Car and Driver tests this at 75 miles per hour to see what the actual range of these vehicles is relative to what the stated range is, the EPA measurement. And so Tesla is notorious for doing very well on these EPA tests, uh, but then not so hot in the real world on the highway. And so you can see the discrepancy here with the different vehicles. Um, Porsche gets very close to their rated range, so I think that's really cool. 
talked about the Porsche, 97% um, of their stated range is what they get on the highway versus the worst, uh, this car we're sitting in right here, Tesla Model 3 Performance getting only 71% of its stated range on the highway. And that holds up with my own experiences. This thing does not get anywhere near 310 miles on the highway like you know the, the stated claim of the range is. Now, Tesla isn't giving you a number and saying, hey, this is our highway range. They're saying, hey, this is the EPA rating. So it's not like you know they're being deceptive necessarily. It's just that on the highway, which I feel like is a much more uh, relevant information, it does not travel 310 miles. What will become interesting throughout this video though is that despite this massive discrepancy that Tesla has between EPA range and actual real world highway range is that they're actually extremely good at road trips. So as I mentioned, Car and Driver did this 1,000 mile loop with these 11 electric cars. And so the whole idea here is that there are certain waypoints that every car has to go to. Every car has to check in at these certain waypoints. Um, but as far as how they get to those waypoints, they can take whatever route they want, uh, you know, based on chargers, whatever they want to do, right? So it's kind of replicating a road trip. You're traveling 1,000 miles. You have certain destinations you want to check out, and then you're coming back home, right? So this 1,000 mile trip, I think the biggest question is, how much time did it take everyone? And so if you look at that, um, you know, first place goes to the Tesla Model S, second place goes to the Tesla Model Y, third place goes to the Tesla Model 3. So Tesla sweeps uh, the podium there um, and, and versus the competition, you know, they've got a healthy margin on how much time it actually takes to travel that 1,000 miles. Now for some of these charts, I'm going to add in my own car because I've done a thousand mile road trip in my Model 3 and so I thought it might be cool to just incorporate that within the data and show you how that compares as well. Now it is worth mentioning that my time has a slight disadvantage in that I did it all in one single day versus Car and Driver. All of these 11 vehicles were able to charge overnight uh, as this was a two day test and so that charging time for overnight is not included in the overall time. It's time that people are going to be sleeping. Okay, so you can see how far behind a lot of the competition is compared to Tesla, but I want to do a couple corrections here because not everyone drove the same distance. And part of that is obvious, right? Like if you're seeking out different chargers, you're going to have a different overall trip odometer once you finish those 1,000 miles. But I want to correct for that. I want to pretend that every car traveled exactly 1,000 miles, so I'm going to correct for it. And with Porsche, they actually missed one of their waypoints. So they have a long time that it took them to complete However, they missed one of the waypoints and they had to go back to it. So they ended up driving over 1,100 miles total. So significantly further uh, than everyone else, how far Porsche drove. So if you correct for that, then Porsche is a little over two hours off um, as far as how long it takes them to drive 1,000 miles versus the Tesla. And so also looking at the Mustang, the Mustang was a decent bit behind, but they got you know a bit of a charging snafu that happened where several of the chargers where they were showing up to wouldn't work and so they had to keep seeking out additional chargers and that ate up about two hours. So for the Porsche and for the Mustang, if everything went perfectly, and I'm not saying that it will go perfectly out there with these non-Tesla chargers, I probably won't. A lot of them are problematic, but if everything were to go perfect, the Porsche and the Mustang would be significantly closer to the Tesla times. Um, and so those cars, the Tesla, the Porsche, the Mach-E, those are cars that I feel like I could reasonably recommend today and say, hey, you can get in these and it is possible to go on a road trip and it's not gonna be this terrible experience. The rest of them, I, I don't see any way of actually recommending them for a road trip because it just seems like it would be awful. You're spending so much time at these chargers. Now there's another interesting thing I wanna do with a bar charger because I'm loving these bar charts and I hope you are too, is I want to do something called a Google Maps reality check. And so this is, we're going to take, what does Google Maps say it will take to do this route? How long does it say it will do it? And then how far are, are we from that time? And so I'm going to say, we're going to take the Google Maps time, we're going a thousand miles and we're going to add 30 minutes to that time. So we have three 10 minute stops. I feel like that's pretty reasonable to assume in a gas car, you could have three 10 minute stops over a thousand miles. You probably would stop more than that, but maybe you're trying to go for time here, maybe just two 15 minute stops, whatever. We're adding 30 minutes to whatever time Google predicts it will take to do this route. If you look at the other cars compared to that Google Maps standard plus 30 minutes, 
Tesla with the Model S is only 20 minutes behind, and this is a thousand miles we're talking about. So 20 minutes is nothing. That's very impressive. How close Tesla is, considering the fact that you do have to visit chargers to Google Maps predicted time. So I think that is very cool. The other ones get fairly close. Again, these are all corrected for a thousand miles. And so they get pretty close, um, you know, with the Porsche, with the Teslas around two hours. Uh, the Nissan Leaf plus 14 hours, absolute insanity. So why is the Nissan Leaf so bad at road trips? Well, apparently, I was talking with Car and Driver about this, and part of the reason is you can only get one fast charge within a 24 hour cycle because this thing is air cooled, the battery is air cooled. So the other times that you're visiting a fast charger, you're not actually charging quickly because the battery pack can't handle it because it's getting too hot. So the Nissan Leaf, despite its 225 miles of claimed range, Range, um, does not make sense at all as a road trip vehicle in my opinion because you're going to have to spend so much time at chargers. So another thing that's interesting to look at is to just look at how much time was actually spent at chargers. Uh, so Tesla doing really well here, not spending all that much time uh, at chargers to you know travel that 1,000 miles. And then also looking at the average speed you were traveling throughout those 1,000 miles. So, you know, the Tesla Model S doing over 60 miles per hour for the average versus the Nissan Leaf, its average speed for its entire trip uh, was a little bit over 33 miles per hour. So just by looking at the data from this trip, you can see that numerically based on merit, Tesla wins, right? But that's not the whole story. Uh, and so I asked car and driver, you know, how many of the drivers were using the onboard navigation from these vehicles in order to get around and find these chargers versus how many were using their phones? Uh, and it seems like pretty much all of them used their phones at some point, um, but definitely everyone that wasn't in a Tesla was relying on their phones, not relying on onboard navigation. So Tesla's onboard navigation is fantastic. It'll you'll, you point to point, you tell it where you want to go, and it will get you there. I could feel confident putting my mom, and sorry mom, but she doesn't understand technology well, putting my mom in this car and telling her to go somewhere, she could punch it into the navigation, and it would tell her what to do in order to get there at a reasonable pace. Pace. Um, not a perfectly optimized pace, but a pretty good pace. And the others, that is not true. I could not put my mom in any non-Tesla electric car and tell her to get across the country today. Today it is too difficult. It is uh, a cumbersome experience that you have to put thought and math into uh, in order to carry it out. And it's just something that my mom wouldn't have the patience to figure out. She could do it you know, if she wanted to, but she would be like, this is so silly. Why am I wasting all this time with this terrible user experience? Like, get me out of this. I should say that in different words, but uh, I'm putting it nicely. So Tesla has really focused on that user experience. And I think the Ford Mustang Mach-E actually does pretty good. They get pretty close in that you can just plug it in to an Electrify America charger and it just works. Uh, also with the Mustang, the navigation will automatically route you towards Electrify America chargers. So I think that's good. Um, but when talking with the driver of the Mach-E from this test, they said the first Electrify America charger they showed up to it didn't work just blue screened and and so they had to use another charger thankfully ea chargers have multiple chargers at one spot um, so you're not showing up and hey it's the only one charger like you might do at a charge point or uh, an ev go it's the only one someone's eating their breakfast while their car is charging and you're like well i guess i just sit here all day and so that's really one of tesla's big advantages right like traditionally car makers make cars and gas companies sell gas and that's pretty easy like it's pretty convenient there's standards for gas you know you go out there you get it it works uh, regardless of which gas station you go to your car keeps running right uh, with electric cars you know automakers are using the same process they've always used they're saying we make the cars electric charger companies make the chargers and there are standards again but it's not a smooth process and so Tesla says, let's take everything and put it with our, our control, put everything in our control. So they control the charging experience, where the chargers are, and they control the creation of these cars. So they all communicate very cohesively and everything works out very beautifully um, versus no one else really seems to try this methodology and it's expensive, right? It's challenging to do. No automaker wants to put up that much money in order to make it happen. But Tesla did it as a startup 
uh, and, and has made it work and the user experience is fantastic. So it's really beautiful to see that it can be done right. Um, and if you go through and you read this magazine, uh, which I recommend you do, about the non-Teslas and the charging situations that they got into, showing up to chargers that don't work, showing up to only one charger, and there's multiple people already waiting in line for one single charger. It's like there is insanity that you have to go through, uh, whereas with Electrify America, which I think is getting better, but definitely with Tesla, you know, you have multiple supercharging stalls. It's a smooth process. You just plug it in, it works. Um, it's just so much smarter than the competition. Now it's worth mentioning, if you're watching this video and you're like, why are Volvo and Polestar doing so terribly in this road trip test? Well, during this test, Volvo and Polestar vehicles were not compatible with all Electrify America chargers. They were compatible with some. Now apparently that has been updated uh, and so they all work, but this just drives home one of the points that I really hate about modern EV vehicle releases. And that is first impressions matter. First impressions are very important. And so many of these electric cars are released unfinished. And it's fine for cars to get better over time, but there are certain things that are just unacceptable to have a car released and then these not be a part of it. So saying that here's an electric car, it doesn't work with the chargers out there right now, but it will someday, that's insanity to me. Um, Volkswagen not communicating with their own chargers that they make, that's insanity to me. Uh, during, this, during this road trip, the Volkswagen ID4, it didn't show the speedometer or the battery, the remaining range that it had. There was a part where it just glitched out. It's like, these are unacceptable glitches for first time EV buyers to be experiencing because they're gonna get turned off from it very quickly and for a correct reason. Like, I can't fault anyone for getting an electric car, showing up to a charger, it not working, and then saying, this sucks, I'm not doing this. That makes sense to me. And so that's what I admire about Tesla because despite all the insane marketing stuff that Tesla does that I think is really dumb, like you know the, the rollout stuff, uh, the full self-driving stuff that's just never gonna be released as level five, it's like they keep saying, you know, level five is coming, it's right around the corner. It's not, it's not coming uh, anytime soon because every deadline they've said, it just hasn't hit, right? They've got all these cars they say they're gonna build, Cybertruck, Roadster, blah, blah, blah. They never hit any of these deadlines. That stuff's really annoying. But when it comes to the actual cars that they do make, the user experience is very well thought out and I admire the heck out of that from Tesla. So props to the folks at Tesla for doing electric cars right because they really do put a lot of thought and a lot of detail into making the user experience when you're taking a road trip they make it very seamless and very close to what it is like driving a gas car as far as a convenience factor. And then there's benefits on top of it uh, that I really like and why I drive this vehicle still. Uh, electric cars are very cool. So thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. And hey, look, if you like gas cars more, that's cool. It doesn't have to be like a choose sides and get angry at everyone, right? Like we can all like stuff. I have gas cars, I have electric cars. I think they're all really awesome. There's really cool benefits on both sides. Um, I think it's neat. We don't have to be angry about it. We can just, you know, we can chill out. We can make the internet a fun, educational, happy place. At least that's what I hope. Um, there's no chance, whatever.